delighted to say that Professor Hospers is really one of the, the, the biggest names um, that we've got here. When, when Hospers said yes, there was great rejoicing. Uh, lots of others, though, you know, it was very nice that they could come, but Hospers is, is a bit special. Um, so I, I'm going to ask him to start. And then um, we'll have Jeffrey Sampson and finally Nigel Ashford, who, who promises to talk in English. It's, um, I hope I can say this without any criticism of the previous speaker. It was entirely the fault of the organizers and the, um, the technologists who have yet to um, sort everything out, I think. Um, uh, the general comment was that, that it was a tremendously interesting paper, um, but that quite apart from the technical problems, um, all, all speakers should bear in mind that there are also um, many people at this conference um, whose first language is not English. Uh, let me put it like that. And to, to take in what's been said, turn it into precise English, translate it into Norwegian, and then think about it is a considerable activity. And by the time you've done it, you're liable to be into the third sentence after what you've just been processing. So um, if, if you can combine saying a great deal, but with, with a few words, all, of, all speakers from now on, it would be greatly appreciated. And I hope that Norman is not too angry with me for, for saying it after only one speech, and that was his. Professor John Hospers. Okay. Is this all right? Can you hear this way? Since it's our appointed duty to speak slowly and also for not more than 10 minutes, uh, and since the implications of what the previous speaker had to say are enormous and would take hours in the unpacking, one is left with a rather uh, uncomfortable sense of what to do and what not to do. When the subject was announced, of course I had not seen the paper, I thought it was going to be about things that really divide libertarians from one another, uh, uh, gradualism, uh, anarchism, and so on and so on. But happily, it uh, wasn't that. It has to do with the matter of foundations, which is an entirely different matter, but also, if one wants to pursue it, extremely complex, and one could take one small passage uh, of what was said and, and talk about that for hours. Uh, <clears throat> the theory of human nature, one thing that was prominent. I'm not exactly clear what this means. First of all, it's not very clear what's meant by nature. Let me say a word about that. I don't mean nature as opposed to man. I mean the nature of something. One hears this sort of thing. I used to think that his tendency toward violence was an aberration, but now I think it's part of his nature. By a nature, I think we mean something like this, so it's vague. A recurring set of dispositional traits, of the dispositional traits being, a, being disposed to behave regularly in a certain manner. Thus, Aristotle spoke of cat nature as being the nature of cats to meow and purr, dog nature, tendency to bark and wag tail when excited and so on. Those are all recurring features, and it's still dog nature to do this, even though some dogs don't bark and some dogs don't wag their tails. It's a, it's a pervasive feature, but it need not always be a universal one. Now, the question, if you ask the question, what is the nature of man? There are a number of different kinds of answers, all of which have some plausibility. The one that's been seized on historically by Aristotle as man is a rational animal, and of course this is the one that's taken up in considerable detail by Ayn Rand. Unfortunately, it's not exactly clear what that one uh, means, not only because the word nature is somewhat vague, but also because uh, <clears throat> of other vaguenesses in the, same, uh, in the same sentence formulation. Is man by nature selfish? Is man by nature altruistic? Is man, well, Human beings are all of these things, but human beings vary a good deal from one another, so one person has much more of the mix than another person does, but probably they all have some of it. I mean, the true answer is really fairly unexciting. Uh, the truth is seldom exciting. Uh, 
It's just the exciting statements are very seldom true. Uh, people differ from one another, but you could say this is all a part of their nature that is a general tendency to behave in certain ways. To say that man is rational, well, the word rational is vague because it doesn't refer simply to reasoning, though that's part of it. Uh, it refers, as Rand says, to the ability to um, um, interpret the data of one's senses and so on. That's all, uh, and to integrate, that's all a part of it. I mean, it's really a long job in unpacking to understand or to explain what is meant uh, in detail by the term rational. Nevertheless, uh, it would be equally correct to say man is a rational animal, man is an emotional animal, uh, man is a volitional animal. Uh, these are all aspects, all would be equally true. For example, when a mother rescues her own child from the fire in preference to a stranger's child, it's difficult to say that she's doing it on the basis of rational considerations. Clearly they're emotional. She's also quite correct and right in doing it that way. But if you stick to one fairly narrow formula, at least a very narrow, rather narrow interpretation of rational, then you uh, say, well, most of ethics is not based on anything rational, you see. Uh, <clears throat> there's a lot more to be said about that, but let me suggest this one. Man is a volitional animal. That's usually the one that's been neglected, but it also has its source in Aristotle, though it's not as famous as the first formula about man being a rational animal. But if you want a basis for libertarian thought, I think there it is. Man is a volitional animal. It is the nature of man to will. That is, one is presented with alternatives. One deliberates about the alternatives. That's reasoning. Then one decides, chooses what to do on the basis of alternatives, and then acts in accordance with one's choices. That pattern of things, that's man's or human being's volitional nature. As far as we know, no other creature in the world does this. The dog doesn't present itself with alternatives, then decide, think I'll do this. No, I th I, on the contrary, there's reasons against that, so I think on the end I'll just sit down, and so on and so on. There's no evidence that any other creature except human beings do that. Man is a volitional animal. Moreover, and here comes the basis of libertarian thought. Man flourishes best. Man is in general happier. Man is in general better off when he or she is free to do things in accordance with his or her own choices, which are not always wise choices, but then presumably the only way to get wise choices is to have unwise choices at the beginning and then learn from experience. That's also a part of human development to be permitted to do just that and to have nothing stand in the way of doing that. As Bertrand Russell once said, if a human being tried to live the life of a pig, he would find that his own unfulfilled potential as a human being would make him miserable. And I think in general that's right. That's, that's when man is fundamentally and essentially a volitional being who goes through this pattern of confronting alternatives, choosing, deciding, deliberating. That's, a, that's as close to the essence of human nature as anything, as anything is. Now, from that we get, though the steps will be much longer than I can indicate here, to this, this conclusion. The more men or human beings are left free to decide for themselves what to do rather than have other people make that decision for them, the better off they are, the more prosperous they are, the happier they are, even though they often make wrong decisions. Compare a socialist, any socialist society with virtually any free enterprise society and compare the standard of living and the general and the, the amount of laughter and so on and so on, just for, by way of general comparison. So it's just an empirical that when people are left free to choose their own destinies, they are, though they often make mistakes, in general, better off than when they're not permitted to do so. In other words, the more freedom, the better. And hence we get Spencer's, Herbert Spencer's law of human freedom, put out in 
Man versus the State in 1884, uh, that human beings should be free to do everything they choose to do, to act in accordance with their own choices, except in those situations uh, where they, by acting, they forcibly interfere with the equally free choices of other human beings. That was Herbert Spencer's law of equal freedom, and it could well be a motto for libertarian thought in general. It is, of course, like all general formulas, somewhat vague. That is, uh, clearly, I mean, there are clear cases, uh, murder, robbery, rape, and, uh, theft, and so on. People are forcibly interfering with the choices of others, making them do things that they would not freely or voluntarily have done on their own. Uh, but some, to take a gray uh, kind of case, uh, some would say that uh, libeling someone else is something anybody else is free to do because they've got freedom of speech. On the other hand, others would say that uh, uh, this is an, just as much of a forcible interference with other people's freedom uh, and would harm them even, uh, just as much uh, harming their reputation as, har as doing harm to their physical body. You see, that's an area on which libertarians themselves disagree among an, uh, one another, even though they can both agree on the general formula uh, everybody should act in accordance with his or her own choices and be free to do so as long as he does not thereby interfere forcibly with the choices of other people. Now, um, just to conclude, one side of the coin is liberty, as I've all too briefly explained it. The other side of that coin is rights. The notion of rights is the notion of a no trespassing sign with regard to the behavior of some, by, some people with relation to other people. That is, the, the no trespassing sign says, so far, but no further you may go in interfering with my life. Now, uh, of course, as thus seen in libertarianism, rights are primary. They are more important than general utility, greatest happiness of the greatest number, and so on. But I would add a concluding rider to this, there are sometimes uh, phony dilemmas posed, phony at one level but not at another. Suppose that there's a crime wave and the question is, should, should we take someone we know is probably innocent but it will restore law and order and people will think they're being protected and it will be for the public good, etc., etc. And you could make a utilitarian style calculation to say, well, yes, you should sacrifice the innocent person, even though it means violating his rights, it's done in the name of the public good. And of course, the advocate of rights will categorically deny all of that and will say that this is just, uh, this, this is as wrong as anything could be. I would just add that in the long run, even from the point of utility, it isn't the best policy. That is, from, even if you take long run utility, the, the system with the highest utility is precisely one that respects individual rights. And so the libertarians are correct in putting the emphasis where they do, on the rights on the one hand, and on the vast importance of freedom on the other. I'm afraid that's about all I have time for. Thank you very much, Professor Hospers. Um, those of you who are uh, tantalized by the brevity of the comments are reminded that all three speakers um, at the, of this uh, event will be speaking at greater length on other subjects later in the week. So we will be hearing again from John Hospers on Thursday morning. Um, and as you've heard, that'll be uh, something to look forward to. The second uh, commentator on Norman Barry's paper is um, Jeffrey Sampson. And I'll hand over to him now. Um, well, Norman Barry uh, distinguished various brands of, of liberal or, or libertarian, for those who prefer that word, um, in terms of uh, what fundamental principles they derive um, the, uh, uh, the obligation to, to uh, construct a free form of society from. And uh, I think two of his three main uh, varieties are... Uh, uh, were liberals who derive liberalism from a concept of human rights, which is in turn, um, in one case, 
um, derived from a concept of human nature, uh, but in uh, the other case, he talked about uh, liberals who um, derive their political principles from um, what's called a pure side constraints view. This is a term that um, I only know elsewhere from, from Nozick, and I'm not quite sure that I know what Nozick means by it, but uh, the point was that these people don't commit themselves to any particular view of human nature. Anyway, both of these kinds of liberal, um, the ones who derive polit uh, particular doctrines of what a decent legal system ought to be, what a decent political constitution ought to be, um, from an idea of human rights, are distinguished from uh, utilitarians, among whom I guess I would have to count myself, um, because I'm really rather suspicious of the idea of deriving the very particular quirky systems of law and um, political constitution that any of us here would be likely to regard as reasonably acceptable. I mean, any real ones, any real legal systems, any real um, uh, political constitutions that might come into being that we would regard as reasonably good ones, better than ones that exist now, they're all going to be very complicated, quirky, particular. I'm very suspicious of attempts to derive these from a notion of some sort of simple, pellucid uh, human rights which are universal to mankind and can in some sense be directly perceived by intuitive um, contemplation of uh, what human beings are or, or what human beings are entitled to. And let me give an analogy. Um, legal and political systems conducive to freedom are one or two kinds of very good thing that to some extent exist. I mean, certainly our own uh, society here in Britain is not as free as most of us would like it to be, but it's very much freer um, than uh, many other systems that have existed or do exist. Okay, so, so this is one category of good things that exist. Another kind of good thing that exists and from the sublime to not altogether ridiculous, is the motor car. Okay, I mean, I think many of us would feel that life without the motor car um, would be uh, a significantly less commodious thing than it is. Now, one could imagine, um, in the case of the car, too, somebody saying that, well, uh, man has although it's not often very easy for many individual men to, uh, to perceive this, to become conscious of it, but ne nevertheless, in some abstract sense, man has a direct perception that it is the, the proper uh, fate of hydrocarbons to be projected through a narrow nozzle into a large chamber, and um, the carburetor on my Ford Escort is uh, a particular manifestation in the in the actual world of um, complicated um, physical and, and commercial realities of this um, natural fate of, of hydrocarbons, if you want to put it that way. But of course, I give this example because it's a ridiculous example. Nobody would think of saying that kind of thing about uh, motor cars. We're all perfectly well aware that the motor car is an invention, uh, a new thing, not something that can be derived from uh, pre-existing principles, things that go far back in human history, something that uh, we had no concept of uh, up until fairly recently in human history. Now, people feel, I think, about matters like law and politics, that these things are so much more fundamental to our lives, they're so much more important, significant, noble, that it's not satisfying for them to be uh, new inventions in quite the same way. It's not, it, we can't feel happy with um, advocating particular kinds of legal or political system unless we can uh, claim deep roots for them. But that feeling of ours uh, seems to be something not well-founded. And a point that 
I think is worth making is that among people who discuss human rights, there is often an assumption that everybody understands the concept of rights, the difficulty is only to decide what particular things are in fact rights of human beings or whether in fact there are no things which are rights of human beings. The concept of right is uh, not in itself particularly controversial because it's, uh, it's more or less a universal concept. Well, it's not a universal concept. It happens that in the European uh, languages uh, the term right can be translated fairly easily. I mean, we say human rights in English. Uh, in French, one can say les droits de l'homme, and so on, I would guess, in all the other European languages. That's only because Europe is, as a matter of historical fact, a fairly homogeneous uh, cultural area. If one moves outside the areas of the world um, whose thinking is um, derivative from classical uh, Rome and Greece, uh, these concepts don't necessarily crop up at all. I mean, the, the part of the non-European world with which I have some familiarity is China, and um, the term right in Chinese, which is Chan as it happens, is very much a neologism, a word that was pressed into service in order to translate a Western concept in the 19th century when so many uh, Western ideas suddenly became interesting to the Chinese because um, Western uh, technology and commerce was coming into contact with China. It's not even uh, universal to humankind by any means to think in terms of the category right. Therefore, how can it possibly, um, how can we possibly hope to find some particular set of human rights which universally mankind can recognize as, yes, the rights that we do, that do indeed inhere in us, irrespective of the particular culture that we happen to be uh, born into. And I think if one looks at um, some of the examples that Professor Barry quoted, I'm no kind of expert on the uh, philosophers uh, that he quoted, but um, simply based on, on um, uh, the quotations that, uh, or, or the allusions that um, Norman Barry made. Um, he mentioned, for instance, that Grotius uh, talked about um, a, a right to uh, not aggress on one another and a right to a fairly large measure of liberty. Well, it seems to me it's very easy to find uh, societies in which that right is by no means recognized. And you don't have to go actually very far away either. Um, boarding schools in our own country. Uh, I've never attended one myself. Uh, I went to a day school, but from everything that one hears about them, um, the society of uh, boys, I don't know whether it's as true of uh, mixed or, or girls boarding schools, but certainly boys boarding schools seem to be societies which find natural a high degree of authoritarianism, a highly hierarchical society in which it would appear um, a joke to, to suggest that there was uh, a natural right to non-aggression and to a high degree of liberty of the individual. Now, I'm not saying that the fact that, that we can find groups that regard these things as natural makes them good. I don't. I am a liberal. I think that a high degree of freedom, non-aggression, are thoroughly desirable things. But um, in order to sum up, because I think I've used about as much time as I ought to, um, what I want to stress is that these things, the fact that these things are very good things and the fact that they are very fundamental good things shouldn't make us feel that they are not inventions, novel innovations of the human spirit as much as the motor car is. Not as new as the motor car, of course, but nevertheless, in the enormously long stream of human history, really rather recent products of the creative, innovative human spirit. That, to my mind, doesn't in any way demean them, make, make them less than they are. Most good things are 
novel innovations. What's important is for us, when good new things are invented, is to recognize that they're good, try to make sure that everybody else recognizes that they're good, try to make sure that they're not let go of again as freedom has been coming into great danger of being let go of again, having been invented only really rather recently. Well, I think I'll stop there. Thank you, Geoffrey. Um, may I remind you that he will be speaking again this afternoon at three o'clock, and also that um, there's a book he's written called Liberty and Language, a title that will not surprise you in the light of the way he um, approached this particular topic, uh, on sale at the back. Um, our final uh, commentator is Nigel Ashford, and I'll hand over to him now. Um, Norman Barry finished his uh, presentation on saying that libertarians are faced with a choice of whether they seek um, the basis of their ideas on an empirical, common sense view of human nature, or whether they turn to a rationalistic, constructionist uh, conception of human nature. As an academic, I live in a profession where common sense is not something that's highly valued. Um, people make their fortunes by taking an idea that is generally considered common sense, wrapping it up in a certain language so that people don't understand it, and that's how you establish an academic reputation. An even more successful way is to take an idea that's based on common sense and show exactly the opposite. For example, a bit further away, is it? That's better, is it? Right, sorry. Um, where they try and take a, an idea based on common sense and demonstrate exactly the opposite. So the way in which economists have managed to create a reputation demonstrating that if you want people to be more productive, then the way to do it is to tax them more, even though that goes against the basic common senses that we understand. So my, my immediate reaction is always, is, well, let's see if the common sense way works. If it doesn't, then perhaps we may consider uh, looking at other directions, but let's see if we can. And what I want to do is to take the, the three uh, ideas that Norman Barry attributed to Hume on uh, common sense views of human nature and see whether these create some problems for us as libertarians. So the first one was um, that man is partial to his own uh, interest, to his own self-interest. Here I think it's very important for libertarians to make a clear distinction between self-interest and selfishness. And I think Ayn Rand made a very uh, unfortunate error in describing her view as the virtue of selfishness. I wouldn't want to make a distinction that self-interest is, is concerned with pursuing your own interests while recognizing and respecting the interests of other people. When you use the term selfishness, that implies in common sense language that that person does not have respect for other people. And I don't think that's always very clear to people that Rand, in fact, does believe, when she talks about selfishness, she does believe it shows that that includes respect for the self-interest of others. But the way in which she expresses it, I think, is very confusing and moves away from the common sense use of the term selfishness. Now here we have a problem. If people are concerned with the pursuit of their self-interest, then they will pursue their self-interest within the system as it currently works. And that means that if you can organize a powerful interest group, if you can lobby the politicians, if you can bribe a bureaucrat to get what you want, then you will work the system. And for many people, the way in which the political system works does their self-interest a hell of a lot of good. Now, what do we say to those people? How do we convince those interest groups or those individuals who benefit from the current corrupt system of the state 
how can we convince them that they ought to pursue a libertarian view reducing the role of the state? Or do we just have to accept that because it is in their immediate self-interest that we give them up as a lost cause? Another problem uh, is nicely created, I think, by, um, or nicely illustrated, by the argument of a man called Munker Olsen, who argued about the irrationality of voting. He was saying it doesn't make any rational sense whatsoever for anybody to vote. Because the chances of one individual making any difference in a particular election is so small, the waste of time. There's no rational basis for exercising your vote. But of course that also applies more broadly. What do we say to a libertarian? A libertarian uh, may well say, the chances of me having any impact on the political system, of me reducing the role of the state even a little bit, is virtually non-existent. It's very marginal. It's far better for me to um, try and achieve instant gratification, direct gratification, uh, going to the cinema, watching films I want to see, playing with my children. Why the hell should I go to your libertarian meeting? Why should I go out and canvass for your, for your candidate? Even though I think you're right, but my direct self-interest would suggest I'd be better off enjoying myself at home. So how can we encourage people to be, um, if they are self-interested, how can we encourage them to actually involve themselves in the libertarian movement? The second principle that Hume talked about was that people will choose their immediate interests before their remote interests. That seems, once again, seems a very common sense view. Of course, this is a justification that is used by statists. What they say is, well, if we, only, if we had the time to explain to the people what was involved, they would realize that these policies are the sensible ones. It's in their enlightened self-interest. Unfortunately, it takes a hell of a long time, and some people are very difficult to convince Therefore, in order to protect their long-term self-interests, it's necessary for the state to do this, to do that, and do the other. Well, of course, the weakness of that argument is that those who are making the decisions also will choose their immediate self-interests over those of their remote interests. So that's why we can uh, be very skeptical of these arguments. But suppose it was possible Suppose it was possible, as Plato suggested, to have the, the philosophic guardians, the people who weren't concerned with their own immediate self-interest, but was concerned with the interests of the community and looking uh, forward to the future. Would libertarians have to accept that, that people who had a better understanding of the long-term self-interest ought to have the right to uh, make some decisions? Clearly, I don't believe that libertarians would, but you do have a problem there about what you do with people who are not, like most of us, very often not so concerned about our long-term self-interest. And that is the problem that, that Norman Barry raised about the fact that we certainly believe that a liberal order is in the interests of everyone. But suppose that's not the way in which some people uh, perceive it. Uh, there's a conservative political scientist called Edward Banfield who argued that if you wanted to understand the differences between classes, you should understand it in terms of differences of time horizons, i.e. to what extent immediate interests came before remote interests. So what he said was, was that lower class people, ghetto people, tended to have a, a very, very short time horizon. They were concerned with instant gratification, surviving from one minute to the next. Working class people tended to have a short time horizon, middle class people a longer time horizon, and upper class people having a very long uh, term uh, time horizon. Well, if this is true, is this an explanation for why libertarianism has been very unsuccessful, in my opinion, at attracting much support from working class people. If it's true that middle class people are more likely, educated people, are more likely to have a long term, a longer term anyway, 
time horizon, they may be able to see that a liberal order might be in their disadvantage in the immediate short term, but would be in the advantage of everyone uh, in the long term. They may be able to perceive that, but it might be difficult for those people with short time horizons to be able to perceive that as we might be forced with the situation, that libertarianism might, be, might become simply a middle-class ghetto and able to make a successful appeal to a broader working-class base. Um, I'll try and keep it short. I'll, in that case, I'll leave the third point uh, about human nature, about the existence of scarcity, and just make three just sort of uh, odd comments. One is, is that this debate about rationalistic and versus spontaneous order may appear to be very remote to, to immediate concerns. I want to give an example where I think it is of some uh, concern, and that is the question of what do you do about constitutions and constitutional reform? At the moment in the United States, there is a big debate about the question of a balanced budget amendment. The idea the Constitution should be amended in some way uh, in order to ensure a balanced budget. Now, my concern is not here with the pros and cons and the difficulties of doing that, although they are very great. But you have one set of people, particularly led by the public choice theorists, who argue that you need to reconstruct the Constitution because the way in which the political system works has certain biases in favor of the growth of the state. But those people who support the, the first view, the first uh, view, the emphasis on spontaneous order, will be very skeptical indeed of any attempt to try and reorganize the Constitution. They're very skeptical towards that attempt at trying to achieve a balanced budget amendment. So what I'm saying is, is that depending on which view you take on these two different views, may have an important impact on your view of the question of constitutional reform. Two final points um, related to the discussions we're having later uh, with Dr. Peter Bregan on the psychology of freedom, and that is, is it innate in people for them to identify rightness? Um, uh, Adam Smith talks about the sympathy that people have a sense of what is right, a sense of propriety. Well, that was an interesting question for psychologists. Is there an innate sense of, of rightness that people have? Or does it need to be developed? And what about those people who do not have that sense of rightness? What should we do with those sorts of people? And of course, uh, it also talked about children being born with a sense of rightness. Where well, Francis Kendall is going to be talking about the freedom of the, of the child. Um, I've not had the experience of having to bring up a child. But my experience with my, my nephews and my godchildren does not suggest that they have an inborn sense of rightness. So where did this come from? How do uh, they achieve this sense of rightness? So to conclude, my sympathy is to try and see as if this common sense view will be satisfactory. Clearly there are problems. I've identified some. There are many others. But I would prefer to try and see if we can resolve these problems looking at the first tradition before, and I'd be reluctant, although not totally excluding it, before turning to this rationalistic view. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nigel. Um, it's very interesting that um, Nigel's derived from what uh, Professor Barry was saying, a whole lot of questions. Um, some of which I'm sure he was well aware were going to be treated in, in detail in, in later talks, and others of which I think are going to be, even though he may not realize it. I, think, I, I, I suspect that especially Dr. Madsen Piri's talk tomorrow, um, which I hadn't thought of as being especially relevant to today's proceedings, actually does deal with quite a lot of the questions of, of how you turn libertarianism as, a, as an ideal and delightful abstraction into something that actually suits people to do. So uh, that's something to look forward to. Um, but finally, I'd like to ask um, Norman Barry to um, give us some further thoughts about um, the comments on what he said to begin with. And um, I expect there are quite a lot of us who'd be interested to n not only to hear what others have said, which is what he concentrated on in his um, opening um, speech, 
but, but also what he himself feels about these issues. That might be of interest. I, I don't know. Uh, Norman Barry. Uh, thank you. I'm not sure it would be of any great interest. Um, <laughs> I'd like to thank the three speakers for giving me some evidence that at least three people heard me. Um, I don't really know how to summarize a 500-year debate, plus an hour and a half, in about five minutes. But I, I will just discuss one or two things that uh, I found interesting from the three comments. Um, Professor Hospers began by suggesting that, well, perhaps the ultimate foundation of liberalism lies in the notion of man as being a volitional creature capable of choosing, not being driven by deterministic laws, unlike dogs who wag their tails, perhaps according to certain sorts of laws. Um, we see evidence for the volitional nature of man through choice, um, choice between alternatives. I fully concur with that view of man, but I'm not absolutely convinced it can derive libertarianism from it. I mean, what about people who make the, the, the choices not to have a libertarian society? There are certain people who are behaving quite consistently with the volitional model of man and are in fact uh, indulging in actions destructive of, destructive of a free society. Well, Professor Hospital rightly added to that uh, metaphysical concept of man a, a, a kind of a size constraints notion that I had myself mentioned that these rights that do derive from man being different are enjoyed by us all. But that is a, a, a moral statement, really, rather than a descriptive statement about the volitional nature of man. I think it's empirically true that men do choose. But whether we all ought to have equal liberties is a moral statement, which I think that David Hume would have leapt in there on Professor Hospice and said, yeah, prove it, or show me. Uh, and it, it's just problems like that that drive me I suppose, towards the position of, a, of, of Jeffrey Sampson, that one has doubts about the universal, uh, compelling nature of these rights. And therefore, I do, if I'm asked my opinions, I am sort of driven towards a spontaneity view. But I was concerned to stress the difficulties in that, which I think Nigel drew out very well, that there is actually, unfortunately, a public good trap in liberalism in the sense that it isn't in our interest to produce it. And if we have a concept of man as Hume describes it, then there can be no certainty that the liberal order will be anything more than a transitional period of human history, which is doomed to extinction. Uh, of course, we can uh, take the view that ideas are ultimately determining, determining factors in the course of history and try and persuade each other out of these public good traps. Um, but once again, we have a problem here to do with consent. If we are to remain liberal, we have to ask people to consent to certain things. We don't want to coerce them to do certain sort, sorts of things. Are we entitled to coerce people who are in receipt of inflation-proof pensions? Or is there agreement to be sought? If you're a complete subjectivist, you have to, in a sense, ask the agreement, because you can't prove it's objectively wrong, to finance public servants. It's a, a value that some hold and some don't hold. Um, if you take uh, the Jim Buchanan view of consent, then we're, we're trapped forever, because since there are no real values, but only consent, then every person's consent is required to bring about the transition to a free society. That, that does follow on from, from the Hume tradition, and it, I find it's extremely disturbing, even though I find the description of spontaneous orders of Smith, Hume, Hayek, beautiful, elegant, convincing, and uh, in every respect ought to be followed. Um, I think that if we are to use coercion to persuade people to abandon whatever government privilege they might have, that coercion must be backed up by a more convincing moral theory than we have at the moment. And if uh, Brian's comments about my opinions were designed for me to construct that theory in the next 30 seconds, um, he's extremely uh, unfortunate, uh, because I won't. Uh, I'd like just to mention a, a point raised by Nigel. One is to do with elitism. Uh, now, we don't like to think of 
a liberal, libertarian society as being an elitist society, and yet we are, in a sense, an elite. Now, there are some sorts of people whose views of social processes are such that they don't really regard these interest group problems as being that important. They don't really regard the Olson, Anthony Downs type explanations of democratic systems as being important. They think, like Lord Keynes, that if only people can get the right ideas, then the masses are passive and an intellectual elite being able to determine public opinion will, of course, change that opinion. And I, I suspect that um, this was the view expressed by uh, F.I. Hayek in The Road to Serfdom. If about 5% of the country's graduates had read it in 1944 and uh, seen the truth of the message, then um, that elite, which controls the civil service, the large industries and the various governmental organizations, would have seen the error of um, statism and changed it. And it is a, a, a long tradition in, in, in classical liberal thought that the masses are indeed passive. There's nothing illiberal about saying that the masses are passive. You're not coercing them or thumping them or saying they're passive. And that may indeed be true. And when people such as Hayek quote Keynes in approval, the only quotation they ever dig up is that one about, you know, uh, mad scribblers, uh, mad economists, are, uh, the defunct economists are dominant and they can be replaced by uh, new ideas. I think that is a very, very uh, optimistic view. And I do tend to think that we do face this enormous problem of sectional group interests who are able to use the machines of the state and yet to coerce those people involves us with similar problems of, of justification. Uh, this brings me to, 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 to a last point uh, uh, raised in connection with, with, with Nigel's comment, and that is about constitutionalism. Uh, I do tend to take the view that uh, constitutionalism is extremely important, and uh, I will try and briefly combine the idea of there being certain sorts of natural moral values with the idea of there being uh, a spontaneous order. Now, I think the most important thing is that a constitution constrains government, and it's not important that government do the right thing or the wrong thing, but just do as little as possible. And therefore, it is less important to argue about um, what would be the, 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 the perfect uh, economic model or what would be the perfect... Um, system of rules of law and so on, but rather spontaneity will occur, spontaneity will occur and produce things that we will tend to like, as Hoffer says, in utilitarian sense, we'll be happier and laugh more often if government does less. The less government does, the more opportunities there will be for these spontaneous processes to, to come in. And it may be the case that if that kind of agreement about a constitution of a really strict kind could come about, we wouldn't have to worry that much about the vexed notion of rights because our natural moral values would be protected merely because the government wasn't doing anything, and, or at least extremely uh, small amounts of, of activity. And I think the high standards that, that, that Ms. Rand has set us, most of us could never reach the standards set by her characters, um, would, would not seem to be the kind of burdens that they appear to me every time I open the pages of that, the shrugged. Um, I could never be a John Galt. Now, um, the moralistic view of libertarianism always does, in fact, frighten me a little. And my own view is to come more down to the spontaneity view, except that I have a streak of rationalism. I want us to sit down and plan this constitution that stops government doing anything or very little. Well, 